Good afternoon, everyone. We're about to begin. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carol Ann Wright. I'll be your moderator for this panel. Um, so I see people still coming in. That's great. Um, I, am a, I work for the Halifax Partnership. I am a community economic developer, a director of strategic planning and uh, strategic initiatives. And so it is my pleasure to bring you this incredible panel that has so much information to share with you. So you won't be hearing a lot from me other than to ask some questions. And so uh, without further ado, um, I'll just read you the brief description. This session will focus on housing challenges for the African Nova Scotian people. Um, each, each panelist has their own unique experience and a wealth of knowledge on their areas of expertise. And so I look forward to that. Um, and as communities leaders, they will provide a perspective on what is needed and to understand the issues. And now I know all these folks and so they're very direct. So if you have faint of heart, you gotta leave now. <laughs> um, so as the panelists come, we're gonna have them introduce themselves. They'll tell you without me going through and introducing them. So our first panelist, um, Ms. Rochelle Butterfield, is gonna come forward uh, from Adsum House uh, for Women and Children. So she's gonna start with that. Thank you, Rochelle. All right, hi, how's everyone doing? All right, I'm a little nervous, but I'm gonna try to hide it so I can get through this presentation. All right, thank you all for joining me here today. Let me just make this. How do I make this big preview? Should load. There we go. Okay. So I get settled here. I'm all right. I'm all right. I just got to make a little room. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So I work for Adson for Women and Children. So it's a nonprofit organization locally based here in the HRM. So, oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Good, all right. So I wear a multitude of hats. I am an intensive case manager, but I'm also a program coordinator for the Journey Home program, as well as a housing support worker. We like to joke at the office, I'm more just a support worker at this time, because there's not really housing for people to go. But let's get started, okay. So, an overview of the topics of discussion. So, this presentation will provide an overview of the coordinated access system, the Journey Home program, as well as identify challenges and barriers to securing housing for African Nova Scotian families, and highlight some recommendations. So, let's get started. So, just some background information. Canadian definition of homelessness, just so we're all on the same page. So, describes the situation of an individual, family, or community without stable, safe, permanent, appropriate housing, or the, or the immediate prospect means and ability of acquiring it. So, this ranges from different circumstances, whether someone's unsheltered, emergency sheltered, provisionally accommodated, or at risk of homelessness. So it is a result of systemic or societal barriers, a lack of affordable and appropriate housing, and individual slash households financial, mental, cognitive, behavioral, or physical challenges, and or racism and discrimination. So some examples of those could be if you've been hit with an eviction notice, or if you're living in hotel, or shelter, or staying in a vehicle, or tenting, couch surfing, and other temporary locations. So a little background and add some for women and children. So it's a nonprofit organization that operates within Halifax Regional Municipality to support marginalized individuals and families who experience poverty and homelessness. So Adsum works predominantly with women, but often supports gender diverse people. The organization also works with families, most of whom are women led by single mothers. So my focus is on the outreach office and the work that we do there. Adsum's very multifaceted. They have independent living homes. They have like the Sunflower, the Court, Alders, just various supports in place to kind of maintain and support individuals while they're living there. However, the outreach office, based in Albro Lake and Dartmouth, it is comprised of different outreach workers. So we have intensive case managers, housing support workers, social workers, and we provide ongoing support and services to assist individuals and families with existing homelessness, with exiting homelessness, pardon me, 
We provide a continuum of wraparound supports in combination with case management as we support clients to establish and secure permanent housing. So I'll get into the coordinated access system, just so you have an understanding. I'm kind of going to walk you through the steps of when someone's seeking our services, the very first step of how we kind of get them in the system and kind of recognize as someone who is going through this experience. So with the coordinated access system, it's actually a framework. So it's a framework that's designed for communities that can streamline and bring consistency to the process by which people experiencing homelessness access housing and services. So the coordinated access system uses housing first approach along with the standardized and coordinated process of access, assessment, prioritization, and referral for housing and other services across all agencies and organizations in a local area. So here in Nova Scotia, we use the by names list. So it's a real time up to date list of all people who are at imminent risk of homelessness or are known to be experiencing homelessness in the HRM. It is managed by the Affordable Housing Association of Nova Scotia and you basically get consent to do the intake and it's good for a year and BNL participants are prioritized based on their level of need and vulnerability and utilizing a matrix of filters. So I just wanted to note that the BNL is not less necessarily like a wait list nor is it a guarantee of housing or access to housing supports. It's more just to kind of identify and support the process of triaging individuals and kind of linking them to the appropriate supports. So it involves a standardized intake process that includes access. So that's the engagement point. So whether it's a shelter, outreach worker, referral hub, or a trained individual, for an individual or, experience, or family who's experiencing a housing crisis, that's the main point of contact. So then we get to the assessment. So an assessment tool that provides understanding and insight regarding the strengths and vulnerability of each person to help aid in the system being able to accommodate those with the highest level of need first. So we like to use the Vulnerability Index Service Prioritization Decision Assistance Tool. It's a lot of words to basically just say it's used to assess risk. So some of the questions can be fairly invasive. Sometimes it's questions relating to if you have involvement in the criminal justice system, if you have any addictions, or if you have um, just, I guess, your experience of housing overall, just to, if you've experienced violence. So sometimes the questions can be a little hard to get through. So we like to be very trauma-informed when we're delivering these questions. And um, the person can also refuse to answer too if it's a little bit too much. So then we do prioritization. So the priority is based upon the unique set of layers of filters. So in the HRM, there's different service providers that kind of support a specific need. So for instance, there's Phoenix House that support youth. And then as them, we support families. There's also the Mi'kmaq Friendship Center that supports indigenous folks and so on and so forth. And then there's a the process of referral. So the process by which an individual or family is matched to and offered housing or housing support based on the project specific eligibility, needs and preferences. So I just put a little bit of example. This is like a VI spadat. This section is just presenting needs. So you're pretty much asking like, can most days, can you find safe places to sleep, clean water, can you wash your clothes, things like that. So it's broken into different sections related to, I guess, different risks that could be associated with experiencing homelessness. And then this excerpt I took from the by names list. I felt it was really important to highlight this just because it was recently updated this year to actually add do you identify as African Nova Scotian, Black Caribbean, or African descent? And then at the bottom, are you one of the 52 historic African Nova Scotian communities? So I thought that was really important to highlight. Just it's constantly updating, it's constantly changing to try and meet people's needs. So as we use them, they change with the demand and things that are being noticed within the field. And then this is part of the BNL intake. So this is the CC consent for release information. So basically it is a case conferencing table. So a group of individuals from all different service providers come together at the table and they basically discuss different situations and different supports and safety to help support whoever they were talking about. But it's very like, it's anonymous. It's just kind of like, kind of discussing, oh, you might have a resource that meets this need that we don't. and so. That kind of helps people get the help that they need. And then also a part of this by names list slash coordinated access system is HIFIS. So 
The service provider will collect and enter the individual's information into a secure database called the Homeless Individuals and Families Information System. So this database belongs to the Government of Canada, but is managed locally by the Affordable Housing Association of Nova Scotia. So AHANS will share this on a community level. It's non-identifying information and it's data that basically used to write reports and statistics and have like a wider overview of I guess the state of homelessness in Canada. So it's not identifying data that will not include your name or any information about your personal situation. However, it is collected and there's no end date for this one. So it's kind of used as long as they need it. So this is just a coordinated access, I guess run, if you'd like to see like the outline of how it would work. So the client would, whether it's individual, youth, or family would hit the access point. So that's whether shelter, outreach, contact. Basically, you go through the triage process. So the by names list is the very first thing that we do. We do the assessment, the intake, get consent for this information to be provided. And then we go through the prioritization process and then match them to the appropriate service to support their needs. All right, so now into Journey Home Program. This is the program I help run at ADSUM. So the Journey Home Program's key principles is a housing first framework. So it's a, right, it's a rights based intervention rooted in the philosophy that all people deserve housing. Moreover, that adequate housing is a precondition, is not, <laughs> that adequate housing is a precondition for recovery. So often you'll see certain supports that require an individual to be sober for a few amount of days or kind of prove themselves. And the Housing First Framework is trying to push the idea that it's a right to have housing, it's a basic need to have housing, and so there shouldn't be any hoops to run, jump through further for them to be able to access that. So it's very client-centered centered as well, the Journey Home Program. So participants get to choose the level of ongoing support, the type of assistance that they want, and the intensity of services they need while actively engaging in the process of acquiring housing. So sometimes my phone rings for one person multiple times a day, right? And other times I don't hear them for a couple weeks. So they get to kind of lead that, anything they need support with, I'm there. And so, with the Journey Home Program, there's no preconditions or requirements for participants to demonstrate housing readiness in order to gain access to housing units. So just some background information. So the program seeks to address the immediate need for safe emergency housing and long-term secure housing by offering a variety of interventions, ranging from eviction prevention, rapid rehousing services, to ongoing outreach support for families to maintain housing. So research tells us that children who live in homelessness run the risk of doing poorly in school, developing negative health and mental health outcomes, and having behavioral issues as well as risk struggling to exit poverty as adults. So that's kind of why the Journey Home Program was developed because shelters don't take, a lot of shelters don't take children. And so you're running the risk of being homeless with your kids with no way to go, nowhere to go, and then CPS involvement, as in Child Protective Services, can often intervene. And so the Journey Home Program was kind of made to mimic a similar program called the Diverting Families Program, in which we're supporting families to try and meet the, re, to try and address that immediate need for shelter, and then work with them to kind of maintain and acquire more long-term, permanent, stable housing. So barriers such as poverty, discrimination, gender inequality, racism, disabilities, and trauma all intersect and create layered barriers to securing housing. So for families of color, the risks and consequences of homelessness are compounded. Discrimination and historical trauma have a cumulative effect and are linked to people's experience of homelessness and housing instability. So just, we basically, had a talk with East Preston Family Resource Center working with the Prestons in trying to collaborate to try and meet the needs of the community. So the Journey Home Program is created or was created to basically help support not only African Nova Scotian families, but families that are in the rural area of Preston's. And so there's not really access to many services and things like that. So it involves developing crisis plan alongside with their clients, advocacy for clients, as well as connecting them to different social and community resources. And the tentative eligibility criteria is just to be connected to the Prestons, whether that's through kinship or any like familial relations, things like that. So it's East Preston, North Preston, Cherrybrook. It's in like the Lake Loon area. 
And then also be a parent or a family member or a caretaker of a child. So kids have to be in your care or you have to be in the process of being reunited with your <laughs> child. So with housing being the only barrier, that's usually when I help support um, single mothers who don't currently have their kids in the care, but that's another thing. And you must be at imminent risk of homelessness or currently experiencing homelessness. And there's a certain income threshold that you can't surpass, but it's pretty flexible as well. So the original design of the Journey Home program is to one, identify, prevent, and intervene to support families at risk of or who are currently experiencing homelessness. The second step is to utilize emergency housing units for families for approximately three to six months to address the immediate need for shelter by offering temporary housing for families while they look for permanent housing. But right now, capacity is at an all time, everything's stuck, everything's stuck. Resources aren't available, housing isn't there. So the process of actually having emergency units on hand in order to support families and then help them get more permanent housing isn't really happening. So people are staying in emergency units longer than expected with nowhere to go. And so we've kind of had to shift and kind of adapt where necessary. But either way, while we're supporting the families, we're connecting them with different service providers and providing wraparound supports. So whether the client has is struggling with addictions or mental health, I'm actually reaching out to different organizations and service providers and connecting them with those resources in order to try and help combat those barriers. So these are just a couple programs that recently popped up to try and help facilitate the process of trying to support someone. Because as I said, I'm a support worker, not a housing support worker right now. So there's the bridge. So it prioritizes supporting individuals who are chronically homeless and living with significant barriers to being able to secure and maintain housing. That can include living with physical or mental concerns that significantly impact day-to-day -day living, as well as substance use concerns, intimate partner violence, and family violence. There's the Shelter Diversion Program. So they work with the Department of Community Services. So they actually provide funding for families to be in hotel. And so they basically, if someone has nowhere to go and there's an emergency line to basically address that immediate need for shelter while we try and contact them with a housing support worker. And then there's also the Overlook, so it's a harm reduction peer supported housing project run by the North End Community Health Center. And this project is designed to support individuals and couples that are 19 years or older who experience active, active and problematic use of drugs and or alcohol. So this is all just to say the demand is really high and resources are really scarce. So z these programs and shelters basically just recently popped up in the last year and a half, two years. And so these are just examples of ongoing support that I can do outside of necessarily getting someone housing. So there's advocacy. So we can speak to landlords and other agencies and organizations. We can speak to caseworkers and we can also have system navigation to support with applications or income assistance or subsidies. So if people don't know what resources to get in order to try and get support, we help them with that. Also with diversion and practical supports, like damage deposits, moving costs, arrears, and more. And just general knowledge, and just about like programs, initiatives, things like that. So overall, the program provides support through an anti-oppressive and culturally appropriate lens by centering the needs of clients and connecting them with alternative resources and professional services providers within the community. So the current limitations of the program, um, building and creating new housing and units from scratch, we can't do that. <laughs> There's limited housing stock and poor landlord engagement, especially in a rural community, so that's been a really big barrier. There's limited community supports as well, and Getting land titles and um, getting land titles and individuals' name has been a really big thing that the presence has told me that they actually are interested in doing. But right now, the journey home hasn't really been able to facilitate facilitate with that process. But we're hopeful in the near future. And then also, we haven't been able to provide ongoing rental subsidies. So clients that can't afford rent, we can't necessarily offer offer um, money ongoing because it's not sustainable at this time. So the barriers that I've noticed. I feel like it's important to just mention historical considerations. Right now, based on the history of the Prestons, black loyalists and black settlers basically were promised land that they don't have ownership over. So instead, they were given tickets. Is that my time? Already? 
Oh no! Okay, give me like three, three more minutes, three more minutes. All right. So instead, they were given tickets of location and licenses of occupation, which means you can go there, or this is the spot you're at, but you can access it, but it's not actually owning the land. So it could be taken away at any time. And so basically, even the government of Nova Scotia, without actually having a land title in your name, you can't build on your land, you can't develop it, you can't sell it, and you can't pass it down. So today, some are in the same situation as their ancestors were two and a half centuries ago, where even though someone could have been paying taxes on their land for how many years, they still wouldn't be allowed to sell it or legally have a deed to it or even pass it to their children because it's technically not theirs under the law. I feel like it's really important to mention that piece because in working with the Prestons and trying to make connections, I, it's clear that there's been a lack of trust in government institutions such as ADSM just based on the historical context of feeling like their needs weren't met before, maybe taken advantage of, so I feel like that's important to say. So just highlighting challenges and barriers in this work that I've noticed. So poverty, systemic discrimination, gender inequality, racism, disabilities, and trauma all intersect to create layered barriers to securing stable housing. So women and gender diverse people, homelessness is directly related to their disproportionate experience of of poverty, systemic discrimination, gender inequality, and violence. So clients of the Journey Home program face diverse social and personal obstacles that include, but are not limited to, mental illness, lack of education, single parenthood, addictions, and histories of trauma and violence. The folks that we work with are managing complex life change challenges while negotiating systems that further contribute to their marginalization such as criminal justice, community service, child protection, and immigration systems. So ADSM recognizes that the more marginalized an individual is, the more complex their experience of oppression will be, and the more likely they are to experience unstable housing and homelessness as a result. So that's why we like to work from an anti-oppressive, feminist, trauma-informed framework. So just challenges that I've noticed. Um, there's a cultural understanding of the experience that was highlighted when I first began this work about a year and a half ago. So older folks with adults in their home that are staying couch surfing, um, trying to get it back on their feet, there's multiple generations staying under the same roof. And so they might not identify themselves as homeless, but based on our systems and the policies, technically they would be considered homeless. So even identifying and finding individuals to support has been difficult if they're not identifying themselves as such. So that cultural piece is really important to consider as well. And families also, I'm hearing feedback, this is feedback from ser other service providers, families not, are not supporting each other like they used to because many people don't want to take on the added stress or have burned bridges with the families fueled by lack of support. And community and family members hesitate to assist because they find community services to be too invasive. So that's another big barrier. People don't want the government all in their business. Why do I want to try and apply for this grant where I can get money if I now have to show you my income or show you all these receipts for X, Y, Z and you're all in my business? I just want to live my life. So that's been a really big barrier. So. Um, a quote from a support worker said, people don't want the responsibility and don't want some outsider coming in because there is a disconnect there and a sense of discomfort. So the family unit has changed significantly. So imagine for an instance, if you are supporting a family member by taking care of their kids and a social worker now has to come in, watch how you're interacting with them, watching how, if you have food in the fridge, if you're taking care of them. And there's that cultural competence piece as well where I heard of um, an instance in which a social worker came and recorded that the person wasn't taking care of the child because she thought that they were looking for lice, but really they were actually corn rowing their hair. And so there was a lack of understanding of the process of styling someone's hair, and that could have implications moving forward in terms of the assumptions made about the care of the child. So culture is a huge piece. There's also a stigma around neat around needing help. So lots of young community members that have nowhere to go but um, don't necessarily feel comfortable about seeking help. So I know that in communities, especially in black communities, people talk, right? So the optics of actually seeking help is a really big deterrent of people even wanting to seek help. So 
that's also a barrier. So people don't really want to share that they're homeless. And as navigators and social workers interact, you can kind of see it over time. So you kind of really have to build that rapport. That was really big that I noticed in the work that I was doing. And just other considerations. Income assistance, rental subsidies, and child tax, and other financial supports are not going up as much as rent is. So right now, everybody knows about inflation. Everybody's feeling it. And imagine these marginalized groups feeling it even more, whether you're low income, whether you're a person of color. It's just compounded with the barriers. There's also the lack of trust in government to start. There's also fewer service providers. So when you're thinking about a rural community, there aren't as many hubs and places to go, especially if you don't want people knowing that you're going there. So that's also a catch-22. And then also a lack of representation in the healthcare and from healthcare providers and professionals. So a lot of clients on my, on my um, caseload will actually confide in me about how grateful they are to have a person of color actually help and support them. They want me present during meetings with CPS. They want me to call on their behalf for certain things because they know that I'm better able to navigate the system itself. So the fear of, not, of being misunderstood and having what you're saying misconstrued is really big on top of being, uh, being discriminated on based on your race. And I've seen that play out a multitude of times where there's someone staying in a hotel and gets approached, why are you here? Show me your room card without calling anyone else out. The little things where you can't really say it, but you feel it, you know? You, you can't say it, but you feel it. So there's also poor transportation in rural areas that impact the accessibility of seeking services. And then landlords as well. Landlords aren't looking to really build in the Preston area and where it's so rural and there's not really new developments for housing. So recommendations is basically to think creatively about housing in rural areas and the chronic lack of infrastructure and the problems there. We maybe can utilize homes that are there, maybe rework them to try and make two units out of one or there's elderly people living in homes with multiple rooms where their kids have gone away, their partner has passed, maybe trying to shift things around to free up more space. And maybe even the landlord piece as well, like incentives for people to actually want Pres Prestons to develop in terms of infrastructure and housing. And then this one is related to supporting clients. I am in no way suggesting that any of the clients bring this upon themselves in terms of the hardship and barriers, but there is something to set, be said about self-agency. And I find when you're going through the storm, the last thing you can picture is yourself getting out of it. And so helping clients to work within the system and actually empower them to say, okay, this is in your control, speak up in a respectful way and be mindful of your approach, but at the same time, advocate on your, for yourself even with the fear of being misunderstood. So that's a really big piece. So not to get discouraged by the bureaucracy and the politics associated with the government funding organizations, but really supporting them through that storm. Because I've seen it be such a beautiful thing where someone comes to me at their very, very worst in the height of a crisis that's ongoing, so everything's heightened, and have them kind of go through the steps, present the proper documentation, kind of get closer and closer to their goal, and you can see their whole demeanor change, their whole, they're more empowered, they're more excited to actually get things done, and then you see that agency kind of take place. But as a support worker, I'm kind of holding their hand through that storm without placing extra um, responsibility on them. Like anything that I can support them with, I try. So I just wanted to end by, I swear I'm almost done, by just highlighting some new initiatives. It's not all bad. So Akuma, they have a rapid housing initiative that they just did where eight affordable homes were just made and it's predominantly for people of African descent. They're also working with Northwood to get some senior homes there as well. And there's the Black Community Housing Council, as many of my other panelists are on. And we actually helped create like an African Nova Scotian housing strategy where we completed a housing needs assessment. So a lot of responders were black and were able to actually give their feedback on the needs of black communities as well. And the takeaway, last slide, I swear. All right, so African Nova Scotians, you know it's bad when it beeps three times, all right. <laughs> African Nova Scotians are a distinct people and the largest racially visible 
visible group, 2.3% of Nova Scotia's population in our province with a deep history dating back over 400 years. There are over 52 historical African Nova Scotian communities in Nova Scotia, each with their own historical context and challenges. We know that adequate housing is essential to the reduction of poverty and social exclusion, yet in Nova Scotia, African Nova Scotians continue to face systemic barriers to safe and affordable housing that meets their needs. The real experts are the community members and individuals and families, consulting community members to ask about their personal experiences, opinions, and ideas for solutions as they relate to housing is imperative. This will not only aid in avoiding pitfalls and setbacks in the future, but it will also set the foundation for solutions that will be able to meet the specific needs of rural communities. So the takeaway should be more rural resources, more research, more locally based services providers, increased cultural competency in the delivery of these services, and more representation. And these are just additional resources, like bridge, shelter, contact information, but that is the end. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Rochelle. Now, did that sound like a presentation of a nervous person? Thank you for that and for your overview and setting some context to the issue of homelessness and housing in the African Nova Scotian community. Um, so up next, without further ado, Sean Parker, Navigator Street Outreach Support Worker for the North End Halifax and Dark, uh, North End Halifax and Darkman. You want to use the uh, I just got one thing to say. Thank you for coming out and have a blessed day. <laughs> No, my name is Sean Parker. Um, I am a Navigator Street Outreach worker. I work for an organization, two organizations, the North End Business Association and the Downtown Dartmouth Business Commission. If anybody's familiar with navigating work, I work with folks that are facing challenges day in and day out. I average about 30 calls today a day, and it ranges from everything from housing to people looking for help from medication, people looking for help from eviction prevention, people looking for help to other resources. And so what I try to do is meet them where they're at. I think the best piece of this work is you gotta have ears. Because you don't have all the answers and all the solutions to them. But if you're passionate and you're, and, and you're listening and building that connection, building that connection, how quick can you connect with that person? You're right, that they believe and they can trust you. Now, I'll tell you right off the bat, I don't promise nothing that I can't deliver. Yes. One thing I can deliver is some essential things like ev eviction prevention. I'll reach out to other organizations and say, hey, how can we get together so that this person don't become homeless or this family don't become ho homeless? How can we reach out? I can reach out to other organizations. How can we keep somebody's power on mm -hmm. so that they can have lights on, have heat on, and not lose the pace? person struggling to meet the medication that can't afford the medication, how can we support them? This work is continuously, continuously, but the hardest piece, and this is from my heart, because I deal with it every day, is housing. Is housing. I cannot promise you something on that. I can work with you and work for you and support you all the way through and surrounding other agencies to see how can we take care of this. But right now, we're in a housing crisis. We're in a housing crisis. Rent, your average rent in Halifax right now has gone up about $1,600, $1,700. You know, they talk about affordable housing. You know what, within my community, you know what we say? Affordable for who? <laughs> Let's just call it what it is. We need to look at low income housing. Because somebody, once upon a time, I just, someone said, you know, $25,000. Oh, you all right, you're almost in that middle class. Not today. There's two classes to me. Either you got money or you don't have money. <laughs> or you don't have money. At times, I'm going to be honest with you. When a mom calls out and say, look, I got no food to feed my kids. I don't care about me eating. That touches you. <laughs> Hold on. What are we? Where are we as a society? You look around and you just see all around. You go right here in the place where you see tents. I'm handing out tents in the middle of the winter. Mm -hmm. 
and then running through Canadian Tire to get myself some canisters of propane so that these folks can stay warm. Mm -hmm. We got some work to do, folks. Yes. We got some work to do. And I'm not saying we can't do it, mm -hmm. but we need all levels to come together. Provincial, municipal, even us in this room. We all can make a difference out here, believe me. Mm -hmm. Don't turn a blind eye to this because it's not gonna get any better. I can tell you this, in the last four years, I've just seen it grow from here to here. And there's no way we as brothers and sisters should be living like this. Because they're your brothers and sisters out there. They are. Some of them have challenges. Some of them have addiction challenges. Some of them have the mental health challenge. But that doesn't mean that we throw them away. How can we support them and get them to a position or to where they feel like, hey, I'm, I'm back, I'm healthy, I'm strong, I'm, I can do it. I say this though, it all starts with the roof over your head. Then you can start putting your life together. You can start working on the support systems that will help you put your life together. I enjoy this work and at times I'm frustrated with this work because of the bureaucracy, because of the lack a service, the wait time for services. But I know it's going to get better. I, I just believe it in my heart. And I will not walk away supporting folks. Because I think it's our responsibility, folks, to look after the forgotten ones. Mm -hmm. It's our responsibility. Mm -hmm. Seriously. <laughs> we all, we all, we all can make a difference. But sometimes just having that conversation or sitting down and listening. I walk around with a lot of coffee tokens, a coffee token and a bagel. I introduce myself, hey, let's have a coffee and a bagel me, on me and you. Just tell me about yourself. You build relationships when you're honest and you're straightforward. Like I said, I promise nothing, but I will go to work for you. I see some of my colleagues over here, like Wyatt, who works with the city on the cleanup. We have here in our city, and I don't know if a lot of you have it in your cities, you're right, designated camp areas and camping areas where folks can go and set up the tent. The city will provide the porta parties, will provide water, will provide cleanup. My man Wyatt right here is a big essential part. I can call on him anytime when I need something, and he's there to support me. That's what it takes. That's what it takes us as a family working together to solve this issue. We just can't depend on the government, no. to be honest with you, because sometimes they ain't got their head and screwed on right to me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? We got to count on each other. How can we make a difference? And believe me, we can. Bless. I encourage you to write your questions down or any comments you have to make because um, uh, we're just going to move right along. So next, Ms. Bernadette Reed from DPEG. Well, good afternoon, everyone. How's this conference going so far? I'm going to take a book uh, big out of my book from my friend from Hogan's Alley. I'm going to get everyone to stand if you want for a moment. We're going to do an African affirmation. So I'm representing DPAD, the Decade for People of African Descent Coalition, and every, when we have our monthly meetings, we start with this affirmation. The African Nova Scotian Decade for People of African Descent Coalition acknowledges and requests the presence of Mother Africa and our ancestors, whose teachings, strength, and perseverance continue to challenge and inspire our community. The ANS DPAD would like to acknowledge that we are in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship. ANSD PED recognizes that African Nova Scotians are a distinct founding people in Nova Scotia who have been a key part of the province's culture and history. The coalition's mission is to build strength and health across African Nova Scotian communities and to forge a renewed working relationship with governments, communities that create conditions for all African descended people in Nova Scotia to thrive. Ashe. Thank you. 
So a little bit of background about DPED. Um, we were formed back in 2016 when the United Nations came to Nova Scotia and wanted to meet with black organizations and groups to find out what they could do to assist us in some of the challenges that we were facing. So we had a big meeting at the Black Cultural Center in Dartmouth. And many of you that are here from away, I hope that you had the opportunity to go over there if you're staying a few extra days to see some of our history between Africville and the Black Cultural Center. There's lots of history there. So they were on a fact-finding visit to find out how we can talk about federal and provincial governments and how we can get civil society groups to be responsible for things that are going on in the black community. So the dialogue with government officials was administered by the Department of Global Affairs and the dialogue with civil society was administered nationally by the African Canadian Legal Clinic out of Toronto. Any Torontonians here? Yeah, okay, we thank you for that service. And locally by the Office of African Nova Scotian Affairs with support from Dalhousie University's Indigenous Black and Mi'kmaq Initiative. The civil society, as I said, was held at the Black Cultural Center with presentation on issues related to education, employment, health, environmental racism, housing, big one, land claims, access to justice, reparations, immigration, youth, arts, and culture. The visit was intended to provide an opportunity for the working group of experts to examine in detail the situation of people of African descent in the country, to identify any problems, and to make recommendations for how these could be resolved. By the nature of its mandate, the working group is required to look critically at the situation in a country and identify good practices that could be replicated in other countries. The visit was intended to provide an independent and impartial assessment. The working group of experts on people of African descent issued its report and recommendations to the Government of Canada in September 2017, and it can be found on their website. So DPAD's mission is to make sure that some of those recommendations follow through. And housing is one of the big recommendations. For people living in the African Nova Scotian community, our historical um, thing is that we do not put our families into shelters. We take care of them. We may have ten, a family of 10 living in one home. That's what we do. We take care of each other as best we can. But the strain of what's happening now is making it very difficult for us. But we need the government to know that they need to take care of some of our housing issues that are taking place now. And as um, Rochelle has already said, a lot of stuff that I could say, so I'm not going to repeat it, about Akuma having the uh, rapid housing, about us looking at the African Nova Scotia housing strategy, about us having our own black housing um, technical resource center, about land trust. We have Curtis Wiley here and Shakira Weatherden. I think she was still here. We are trying to get our land trust to make sure that our people can build on their own lands and can own their own lands and make sure they can bring their families back home. Right now, our children can't come back home from away because they have nowhere to stay, whereas we were promise, I think one of the workshops earlier today, 40 acres and a mule. I think Lynn might have, I don't know who said that, but somebody said we never got what we were promised and we're still looking for that. So as people of African ancestry, our historical value of our 52 communities is to take care of ourselves. We're not looking for handouts, we're looking for support from the government to give us what was promised when we came here as black loyalists, as the War of Refugees 1812, as Jamaican Maroons and everything else that goes with that. So our membership is comprised of 35 organizations and 100 members. We come together to deal with issues such as this. And what we need to know is as a collective, we can do better. And if the government knows that we are working together in partnerships and looking to these things, we can make difference. I know there were lots of workshops today about governments and policies. We need to be sitting at those tables where policy changes are being made. Some of the great things that DPAD was able to do was we were able to ban street checks here. That was, that was decades of work that needed to be done. You know, the great Rocky Jones and many other names we could say that took place. But with our perseverance and working together, we got street checks banned. The stats say one in every 10 black males were being stopped compared to their white counterparts. That is not acceptable. Justice system, where 3% of the population here in Nova Scotia were over 16% in the jails. That is not acceptable. We started our own African Nova Scotia Justice Institute, which now has its own integrated black law firm. And through that, anybody of African ancestry gets an impact on race and cultural assessment, which is called an IRCA. And that means that judges and lawyers have to look at your life situation. If you are homeless, if you are in drug addiction, if you are harm reduction, whatever it is, all of those need to be taken into place before you incarcerate anybody of African ancestry. And then we want them rehabilitated back into our communities, not in the jail system where there's no cultural relevancy nor anything that can support their things. So housing is a big thing. And I know you're going to hear from my brother there, um, 902 Man Up, who was working very hard on shelters for our incarcerated men and women. 
Um, so that is one thing that we do as a black community is we help ourselves. We're not ask, we know what we need, we're gonna ask for it, and we're gonna, well, we're not gonna ask, we're demanding it. We are at the point now, we're demanding, we're going to the premier, we're having a delegation of people, thank you, that need to, and that's what we need to do. We need to go and start demanding what we want. And part of this is reparations. We know that there's many people that are working on reparations and it's, you know, we're 400 years in this country and we're still not owed given what we owe. So we are going demanding. No, we are no longer asking. We are ready to march. We are ready to write petitions. We've had a lot of bills that have gone through that have been successful because we work together. So the thing is to work together to make sure that these things can happen for you. So as our vision is to make sure that African Nova Scotians, blacks and Caribbeans, because we all know when we walk outside the door, society sees us as black. They don't know if we're from the continent. They don't know if we're from the islands. They just see us as black. So we need to also bring all of our blackness together, no matter where we're from. So the diaspora is what we talk about. And once we do that, we will be able to conquer many things. So when it comes to housing, what are we faced with? And Michelle covered a lot of those. The systemic racism, the barriers, the Preston Township, for you that don't, don't know the history of the Preston Township, and in many of our historical black communities, we were put on barren land, not expected to survive. Most of our black communities are in rural areas, high up on hills, rocks and stones, didn't think we could grow potatoes, but I don't know who says the saying, but they, it's, I'm terrible for it, but they thought we were a seed, but we planted. Somebody tell me, what is it? They thought we were a seed, but we are a flower, something like that. <laughs> anyway, we blossom no matter where we're at because we are survivors and we are resilient. So when it comes to building these homes, we know what we need. So we deal with anti-black racism. But our youth today cannot get jobs and cannot get rental apartments because of the location of their address or their last name. So we have to deal with that with our community lying about who they are or where they live or using their grandmother's address, somebody that lives in the city, and we're in 2023, that should not be happening. So when it comes to landlords, like, yeah, everyone says, oh, you speak so well. You know what, that's a microaggression. What do you expect me to speak? I'm a person, I should be able to speak. I speak the Queen's English, right? We all speak the Queen's English, just because I'm black doesn't mean I don't know how to speak. So when you do that, when I call somebody up, I say if I were to call up and go, oh yes, Mrs. Reed, you can come see our apartment. As soon as I show up on the door, click, sorry, the apartment's gone. Right, because I sound like the Queen's English on the phone, but I show up black, so I can't rent your apartment now. So what do I do? I find my white friend, rent this apartment for me, and they'll go rent the apartment, right? No problem there. Same thing when you go into a restaurant. Today, we try to get reservations today, 2023 on Quimple Road, and I, I won't call it the restaurant, but anyway. You go in there and nobody's in there, no reservations, but you walk in, oh yeah, we're full. So you turn away, I go five minutes down the road and get my white friend to go in and she gets to sit down. I come in right behind her and they're looking at me. Yeah, I'm coming in. I dare you to stop me. We need to be bold. We need to call out these microaggressions. We need to call out this anti-black racism that's happening to our people. And especially when it comes to housing, that we are not getting what we deserve. So the serious program that we're, problem that we're facing in homelessness is the city is not listening, the provincial government is not listening, and the federal government is not listening. We know that we are one of the richest countries in this world, and there's no reason why not. My church at Beachville, Carolina can attest, because she's a Beachvillean also. Anybody else from Beachville here? Don't see us out there, but anyway. When we have events at our church and stuff, you know, we, our community, we take food to Victoria Park. We take food to the tents. We take care of, and as Sean said, we are our brother's keepers. We are our sister's keepers. We can all do something to help somebody. So when you have an event, I see all this wasted food here today and yesterday. Somebody could be taking that out to the homeless. We could be feeding people every day. They are not asking for handouts. They just want a place to be. Some of them choose to be intense, as we talked about, mental illness, other things that go on. They can't survive in society. But what can we do to help them feel comfortable in the place that we're at? So we need to get out, get amongst the people, and find out what their needs are, and try to deal with that. We have language difficulties with our immigrants and newcomers coming in. Sometimes they don't understand what the, the tenant, tenancy boards are and what they have to do. So we have to also help them navigate the system. And we have to make sure the landlords understand that they deserve to have housing as best as anybody else. So what do we need to do? We need to make sure that we can invest in low-income housing, not about affordable housing. My community built affordable housing, $800,000. Mm -hmm. Who's affording that? Yeah. Not me. 
And I think I make a pretty good salary, but I'm not affording it. So it has to be low-income housing. And when the developers come in and say they're going to develop something, before the government gives them these handouts, which most of them get, they get free GST, they get all this free money to build, you have to build at least 30% of your building should be low-income, not 10%. 10% a kick in the a kick in the ass, excuse my language. But, you know, it's not even reasonable to say 10%. You should be given 30% of low-income. Goddard Street, anyone knows the history? It's gentrification to the high heavens. Yeah. That used to be one of the strongest black communities in Nova Scotia and what happened developers came in and built up everything now I walk on the street and they think they're in my community they're looking at me like I don't belong there like you're in my community right but now they think they've taken it over because they can afford the fifteen hundred sixteen hundred two thousand dollars rent whereas we can't so they're pushing us out and that's what's happening in many of our communities so we need to prioritize the needs of our community we need to do that Outreach. We need to be on the streets. Thank God for Sean, his organization that has navigated his oath there, the Association of Black Social Workers, uh, the Road to Economic Prosperity, and Carol Ann's going to give you some stats. We didn't do a PowerPoint because, you know, we're passionate black people. We just like to talk. We got the hands going. We got all that, all that stuff happening, right? So, but she's going to tell you some of the stats about, because they have an Af African Nova Scotian index that they've been able to do over the last four or five years. And they are gathering real stats and real information that we can go to the government and say, you need to do better. And this is the stuff that we have. We know everybody across the country has been in trouble getting to segregated data. They don't want us to have our data. They don't want to give us resources. They want to keep us where we're at. But we need to take that onus on ourselves, get our own data, present it to them, and say, now we want the same resources you're giving to the other communities. So that's what we're going to be doing. That's the work of DPAD. As a coalition, we go into communities. If they want us to advocate for them, they want us to do things, that's what we do. So homelessness is one of the big things right now that we're focusing on. We had the first International Health Black Conference two years ago that was excellent. We made policy changes to health. Because, yeah, I got brown skin, but you ain't gonna see no red marks on me. So how can you diagnose me? Doctors and nurses today still don't diagnose us. They think that we can, we can have more pain than anybody else. I'm having a baby, I don't get an epidural, but the white lady next to me gets one. Oh no, you can handle more pain than she can. Like, really? Where's the stats on that? Last time I looked, I was in as much pain as she is. But our doctors don't understand that because they don't have the data. So data is so important. So when somebody gives you a survey, Please fill it out and don't think that they're just trying to get information to make things bad for you. We are trying to get the information to make it better for us so that we have something to fight for. So those are the things that I want to talk about for homelessness because I want to give my brother Marcus the time that he needs to talk about all the things that are going on. But I just want a little show to tell me who's in the room. Where are you from here? Who's Edmonton, Calgary, New Orleans? Tell me something. Say, say your name. Say where you're from. Okay. All right, good. Everybody else from Halifax? Uh, okay. All right. So every, Whitney Pierre. So everywhere you live, there are black people. If you've never had dinner with them, if you've never taken them out or been in their presence, take some time to find out who we are. We are beautiful people, and we welcome you with open arms. Thank you. Good job, Bernadette. Um, thank you for that information. So last but not least, I'm going to ask Marcus uh, James to come from 902 Man Up. Yeah. Hey, Marcus. Welcome, everybody. First of all, I'd like to point out that each of the presenters here today asked me for my presentation. So <laughs> that's what it all, no, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. Hey. But um, what you heard here today is so, so real. 902 Man Up, we're simply a grassroots black men's organization that creates a platform for the black community to have a voice. So often we get left out of these conversations. So we felt that it was important. You know, you heard Bernadette talk about gentrification, right? Well, it's real, right? We felt for the Goddard and Street area, um, no, because we weren't included in the original conversations with all the development taking place there. But we felt, guess what? No, no, you go hear our voice. We leave it up to community to de de uh, determine how we're going to address it. We don't do it as an organization. Like I said, our strength is just creating the platform 
for those voices to come forth, right? And we're going to make sure that the rest of the world hears them, right? And I'm done already? <laughs> Please, right? <laughs> right, but you heard it so elegantly from the previous presenters. And again, I can't say it enough. It's real. 902 Man Up, back in 2020, the midst of COVID. Um, some of you might recall the announcement from our premier at that time in regards to the Prestons. I'm originally from the Prestons, right. and I'm very proud <laughs> Preston, right? Very proud. I'm fighting for my land. Yeah. Here I am fighting for my land, right? Um, but I am from there, and I love it. But if you call back at the very beginning of COVID, there are some inappropriate things that were made in the media about the presence in regards to COVID. No one knew what COVID was, right? So then the decision was made that they would allow families to uh, uh, quarantine in hotels. Well, 902 Man Up was asked to support those families. But here's the reason why. Because initially, they put them in the hotel. They were greeted by corrections, folks. Mm -hmm. Corrections. They were made to feel like inmates instead, right? So community made some noise. Well, do you know anyone from your community that would be willing to you damn straight? 902 man up, that's what we're all about, standing up for our community, right? So we did it, and we haven't stopped. We did it so well to make sure that our own community was taken care of, that HRM asked us to take care of all the HRM pop-up shelters at that time, mm -hmm. all eight of them, right? What did it allow us to do for our community? When you talk about economic growth, well, we're talking about a province that was completely shut down, nobody was working. Well, guess what? We employed 78 people mm -hmm. from our community wow. during the whole time of COVID. That's what we did, right? Because we seen a need, we seen a need. We, you know, we wanted to, it's like Sean said, you gotta wanna do this. We all can make a difference, right? It allowed us to create opportunities. Here today, bringing it into today, well, 902 Man Up manages three shelters, right? We manage three shelters, not just for the black community, but for all communities, right? You know, um, people tell us, oh, you're making history. Why? Because we currently have a shelter being developed in the Preston area, which makes perfect sense because that's where our support system is. It's coming from the largest indigenous black community in Canada, right? Something for us to be proud of. That's where our built-in support system is. So it only makes sense for us to put it there, right? Now we're being told we're making history. Well, we're tired of making history. We want to be included. We're tired of making history. You know, in 2019, uh, 2019, yes, we, along with DPAD, Decade of People of African Descent, we received the Human Rights Award on street checks, right? But nobody wants to talk about the impact of street checks. We all knew it was wrong. And if it's wrong and if it hurts, you need to change it. We stayed in conversations for months on top of months explaining this to the DOJ, Department of Justice, the former minister at that time, Mark Fury, right, and what it does. Now, when we had these one on conversations, guess what, folks? Everybody was in agreement. But when it came to making a collaborative decision about it, all of a sudden, well, we're going to regulate it. Hold on here. I didn't spend the last four months talking about this for you to regulate it. You need to end it, right? You need to end it. We know today it's still taking place, so there's still a lot of work, right? We made some ground, right? But it still needs to be addressed. The other thing is, as a black organization, you know, you heard from each of these individuals, the systemic barriers, the racism, all of that that's involved in this, right? Well, as an organization, we face it too as an organization within a systemic system that does not reflect us, 
right? And I get that lots of po pe folks want to help, but the reality of it is not everybody is on our side. That's the reality, and we see it within policies, we see it within organizations that are being given money that's meant for the black community, for us to grow our community, for us to support our community, but they're doing it. Our ideas, our programs are duplicated, but guess what, they can't get it right. Why? Because those are not the voices that we need to be hearing, right? It needs to come from within, within our own grassroots communities. That's where the ideas come from, right? And I'll point this out and I'll say this. And this is reality, folks. When you're coming into Nova Scotia, you don't see home of the largest indigenous black community in all of Canada. You don't see home of the oldest black community in Canada. You don't see none of that. You see everything else but you don't see that unless it was put there by us, right? So there needs to be some real acknowledgement in terms of our uh, contribution to Nova Scotia, right? And I'll ask everybody, you don't need to give me an answer. What is African Nova Scotian? What is black? Ask yourselves that. Ask yourself, right? Um, Again, I can go on forever and ever, right? I really could, right? I'm not gonna do that though, Carol, <laughs> right? <laughs> but we need to start looking at solutions that come directly from us. It doesn't mean that other folks and other organizations can't support, but you have to understand your role in that. The leadership needs to come from us, right? And I welcome anybody, I don't care what race you were, who understands that and is willing to work side by side with me. That's what we do at 902 Man Up, right? We're getting ready to open up a youth, all black youth facility at, on One Mill Road, right? I need my community, I need my sisters, our mothers there because we're talking about black youth who right now, their headspace is experiencing a lot. They're taking in everything that we're here talking about today. Our mandate is gun violence. That's why I formed the group, myself and Peter Campbell, Sean Parker, we formed the organization to address that, right? But we also recognize in addressing that, there are so many other issues that need addressing. Mental health, lack of job opportunity, education, Right? These are all the things that we have to tackle first. Homelessness, right? We receive at our shelters, on average, probably I would say between 40, 50 calls a day, right? Young men and women coming from out of incarceration, right? Um, some of them from the parents directly, right? And I'll say this, and it's not to contradict what Brendette was saying, but what, one of the things that we are experiencing now is our kids, because before homelessness, it was always an issue within our community. It looked different, you know, because I'm going to be sleeping on Ann Dahl's coach. That's where I'm going to be, right? That's where my next meal, I'm going to be at my brother Sean's house. That's what it looked like for us. Not anymore, folks. Our kids are out there. I'm getting those calls on a daily basis about, you know, can you help my kid? He can't come home, though. He can't come home, but I just want to reach out, Marcus, because I know the great work that you guys are doing. So can you keep an eye on my child while they're out there? That's what we're facing, and it's getting worse, right? You look at... Uh, I know everybody knows the story of Africville. Raise your hand if you know the story of Africville. Right? How could you not? How could you not? Right? How could you not? Right? And if you don't, shame on you. I'll be honest. Well, can I just say something? There's an exhibition downstairs that says you look at it as Africville and Peace Board and Water. My great great grandfather was the founding father of the Africville, William Brown and his three brothers. Mm -hmm. and so I am with of Africa, yes. the great village of Africa yes. that was taken. Mm -hmm. yep. That was taken. It wasn't 
given it was taken. And now that you sit there and you look at it, you see a multi-million dollar container there. Yep. Sitting right on our land. Yep. Right on our land. The only time we go back to Abbeville, folks, is when we have an Abbeville reunion. Yep. Yep. We had to fight the city to turn it from a non-dog park where people were taking yep. the dogs and excuse my expression, shit on Abbeville on our land. Yep. It would never happen in any other sacred land of a community. Yep. Our land was taken, and we, as Brother Dexter talked about we, our reparations, we ain't received a dime for it, a dime for it. But yet, million dollar companies are being built on our land. Well, Sorry, Mark. No, brother. <laughs> Caroline, do I get my time back? <laughs> I'm just teasing. I will give up my time to my brother because we work side by side for the last 20 years, and I will give up my time to him any time. Right? But to his point, you look at Africville, and yes, happened many years ago. What are the impacts of it? You look at our communities today, and Bernadette touched on them. They're changing. They don't look like us anymore. Uniac Square, Mulgrave Park. These were areas that were settled and given to replace Africville. And guess what? Some of our family names have been there for 50, 60 years, and they have children who now are adults with children, and they can't get on the waiting list to get a place in those units. Something that was given to us. Something that was given to us, and our children cannot get units in those locations anymore. They're told about a five-year waiting list, but everybody else is receiving them. Gentrification at its best. Right, but every, and nobody is speaking of that. Our young people do not have anywhere to go. Right, my daughter, right, well guess what? Every month I gotta chip in for her rent because she's forced to live somewhere where she can't afford. Mm -hmm. So guess what? Dad's little girl, mm -hmm. you damn straight I'm gonna help her out. Mm -hmm. Right, you know, that's what we're being forced with. But a lot of us, don't have the luxury to be able to do that financially. We don't. So this homelessness is real. It's real, and it's killing us. And the homelessness and the impact of it is equally as bad as the lives we lose to gun violence. Because we got a lot of young men and women who are committing suicide now because of it. Right, and this is what works, this is our loved experience. And so often we're asked to come to events like this here and talk about it. The truth of the matter is, it stays in this room after everybody leaves. That's the truth. Where are the decision makers? Where are the policy makers? Anybody here, federal policy maker, raise your hand. Right, you know, so this is keeping it real. And our shelters, one of the other things that we're experiencing are young men and women who are in their fourth year of university. Some of them wanting to become social workers. And they're homeless. They're homeless. But they're, you know, they're keeping it together so that they can finish school and complete school so they can change their circumstances. Right? They're homeless in university. There's something wrong with that, right? God has given all of us the ability to make a difference in somebody's life, and we all need to do a better job of it because we all will be judged. At someday, someday we all will be judged. And that's the bottom line. And I don't care what your religion is, right? I don't, right? I'm just keeping it real, folks. Right, and that's who we are as an organization, 902 Man Up. We keep it real, but we're also effective, and we're going to continue to support our communities, and we don't turn anybody away. If you're experiencing poverty, homelessness, regardless on your race, because our community only knows what that feels like only too well, yeah. so we don't turn anybody away. So now you understand how we've been treated for over 400 years, right? So we will not turn anybody away.
If you're experiencing any of that systemic racism for whatever reason, we will support. Our primary focus is the black community. It is. When I look at all the beautiful mothers over here from our communities and happen to deal with the loss of a loved one to street violence, we need to do a better job to support them. Because believe it or not, some of them have gone homeless because of what they had to endure. Right? They have. We're seeing it. I, I have women come to my office who I call aunt, right, who has been a huge impact on my life because they've given back to their community for 30, 40, 50 years. And now today, bring it into today, they're experiencing homelessness because the complex that they lived in, well, the property owner decided, well, you know what, I'm going to jack up the rent. So they can't afford it now. These are folks who I would never, ever thought would walk through those doors to receive that kind of support because they put their time in. They put their time in. We can't allow that. One of the other things that we're experiencing at our shelters, huge increase in seniors. Right? It's, it's getting out of control. It's ridiculous. Right? We're seeing it. Right? And when we ask them, when we do our intakes, we ask them, you know, what happened? Where are you coming from? What was your previous situation like? The mass majority of them are saying, my loved one, my partner, my best friend in life, passed away. So we need to do a better job. We also need to hold government accountable to support those individuals. A lot of what we're seeing in terms of homelessness, addictions, but then there are the ones that they're just down on their luck. So there needs to be something, and Sean spoke about it earlier, and you need to listen to what he said. Timing is everything. Right? There needs to be a faster way to address some of those issues. Right? You know, simply because, and I don't mean to take away from death. I don't. But there's no way that somebody should have to go through that while dealing and mourning, right? They're dealing with a death, a loved one, the loss of a loved one. And on top of that, now they got to be concerned about being homeless? Really? Come on. Who are we? You know, and, and I guess that brings me to my next point, which is being human. Right. You know, being human, that's, that's who we are as 902 Man Up. We look at the human piece of it. A lot of times it's not about policy. I worked for the Halifax Public Libraries as senior manager for 30 years. You know, and I just recently retired. I'm now the executive director of 902 Man Up. And you know what? The fulfillment that I get out of working at 902 Man Up, my way, and being able to make a difference, right? I mean, it, it's, I love it. I love it, and I'm not going to stop that. You know, and when I am there, I act like an 18-year-old. I'm 59. I act like an 18-year-old because I love doing it because I know every day we make a difference. I thank our staff there every single day because they're the ones that are doing the groundwork. They're the ones that are there when someone's crying. They're the ones that, that are there holding them, right? Sharing their lived experiences. The folks we have working in our shelters, very little degree of separation from the very people that they're helping because they have the lived experience. They've been there. They've been there. They understand. Right? Policies are meant to be changed. If it doesn't work, change it. You don't dissect it and say, okay, well, let's add this piece to it. No, take it out all together and rebuild it. Right? These folks right here in this room, all of you, right? if we're, you are given an hour to do that, I'm sure you would come up with lots of solutions. It's folks like you that government need to be listening to. I just came back from a trip, and Caroline, I know my time's up, right? But 
I got to make this point. My sister here, Lynn, talks about reparations all the time. Government ain't trying to hear it. They need to listen to her. I just came back from a trip to Ghana. And I'll tell you what, I'm, the feeling that I got when I got off that plane and Mother Africa reached up through that ground, mm -hmm. grabbed me by my ankles and told me, welcome home. Yeah. Told me, welcome home. Yeah. And since I've been back, and if you go on Facebook under Marcus James, you'll see some of the photos that I posted and my experience there. And when I came back, I knew I'm a free man now. Before I left, I, my mind was not free, right? And I learned that from a lot of our young men and women who are incarcerated. Upon release, in their mind, they're still incarcerated. And what needs to happen and what government needs to pay for is a free trip because it's owed to us, right? A free trip back to the Mother Africa where Mother Africa can claim her lost children. I'm being honest with you, right? Because when they come back, they're going to understand tr what true freedom is. And they're going to be able to wipe away all of those hardships that they endured due to st systemic racism, all of it. They are. I came back here as a new man. Amen. Right? There you go. So you have my story. There you go. I'd like to have another round of applause for the panel. You guys were incredible. Really incredible. And I know I didn't follow the script. We had met before and there was a script about what I was supposed to say and we just, we just float. That's how I love our community. So incredible, if there are people that have written questions down um, and you want to ask them now, this is the time. We have a few minutes. First of all, I'd just like to say thank you for the panel. Uh, I got here a bit late, but I'm already familiar with uh, a few of the panelists and, and the excellent work that they do in the community. Uh, so I just wanted to iterate that again and just say thank you. So grateful that I can be here. Can you put here. the mic to um, okay. Apologies. Um, yeah, I was just, <laughs> I'll say that again. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to uh, the panelists here. I have the, the, the privilege of knowing a lot of the, uh, the folks here in community and the hard work that they do. And uh, I'm just completely grateful uh, to be able to sit here again and, and learn and listen. Um, one point that I had wanted to bring up was uh, within terms of uh, reaching home, uh, uh, funding streams through reaching home, uh, I, I feel that there needs to be a direct funding stream available to black communities through reaching home. Uh, especially here in Nova Scotia where we have uh, 50 plus uh, communities of, of historic African descent. And I, I feel that there's, uh, there's at the moment three community entities working with Reaching Home, uh, which are provided funding. One is the Affordable Housing Association, another is uh, Catlin's Place Society in Cape Breton, uh, Sydney region, and another is the uh, Mi'kmaq Native Friendship Center. Although again, whereas uh, not only are there are many uh, black communities within the Halifax region, uh, there are many, mm -hmm. again, historic communities yeah. all throughout you know, uh, Nova Scotia or Mi'kmaq. So, I mean, uh, that I would believe would correlate to uh, other places across Canada, like Ontario, for instance, uh, where there are many other, what I would believe, historic uh, black communities. But when I look at the numbers breakdown of uh, who was experiencing homelessness, even within the HRM at the moment, 12% of persons who are experiencing homelessness are black or of African descent. Yeah. And uh, that's comparative to only uh, less than 4% of the population here. So uh, yeah. even though the Affordable Housing Association has a, a, a community outcome guide of reducing uh, homelessness within the black community to an effective net zero, that's not happening. So what I, I would need to see, or what I believe is needed, is to, again, fund these organizations that are black-led for us, by us, yeah. in order to actually uh, take care of some of these issues. So I'm, I'm, it's kind of more of a general comment than a, yeah. a question, but I'm just wondering what some of the panelists' thoughts are towards that as well. Sorry to put anyone on the spot. Uh, I, I, I know that, that there's comment. some affiliation yeah. with a hands here, but. Anybody want to take, uh, I, go ahead. I'm gonna pass to you, 
So in terms of funding, I'm glad you raised it, right? So um, the issue is black communities are the experts at, at these issues, understanding homelessness, understanding housing, affordability, low income, all of these things. What has happened over the decades and centuries is this throwing a small grants at communities and communities scramble to figure out how they get the work done they need to get done. So it's a whole mindset that needs to be reestablished in terms of, we are the experts in terms of the issues that we arise. So I appreciate you bringing that forward and you guys can speak to that. But people like 902 Man Up who um, were really, I mean, Marcus didn't, he said a lot but he didn't say this. <laughs> Um, was the issue around you know the funding that really refused? We don't want this. Here's what we want, right? That's what communities have to begin to do. This is the work that needs to be done. Um, the same with the road to economic prosperity. We have government funding, but it was no envelope for it because we did community consultations. The community was able to say, here is what it will take for us to get to develop this five-year economic development plan. And shout out to a couple of our council members that are in the room, Dolly and Charles. But this work has been going on for the last three years. We're in, we're in the three year, th third year of a five-year plan. And that work is community-led for us, by us as well. Although we have government funding, but the community determined what that would look like. And that's, that's the process. So when we begin to change the trajectory around how we get funding and how things get funded, we will be in a better place. I just wanted to add to that. I think want a to. really big thing we need to realize too is with homelessness, this needs to be viewed as a public health issue. Mm -hmm. The social determinants of health are so real. And I see it working with clients. I see it in my day-to-day -day life. The pressures of life getting to you, everything exacerbated. If you can't pay gas, get your kids to work or to school. You can't get a job because you can't get hired. You can't, you have bad credit and all these things. Holistically, I feel like the impacts on health is so huge, both mentally, physically, everything. And I think if homelessness is, is viewed as a public health issue, that's when you get resources, that's when you get education, that's when you get funding, when you really look at how it impacts someone's <laughs> life on a bigger scale, long term, from generation to generation. Um, more, more, more deeper than that, it's a health crisis. Mm -hmm. It's a health crisis. It's the same way. Um, I went to Philadelphia on a conference, um, a ceasefire conference, and they took gun violence as a, as a health issue. And that's how they tackled it. And that's how we have to tackle a lot of the struggles mm -hmm. and things that we go through. It's a health crisis, because it does affect us health-wise, mm -hmm. which leads to other choices that you make. You know, you ask the average person out here, you know, that's struggling with a uh, drug addiction, would you change? Mm -hmm. Sure would, Sean, man. Sure would. I don't like the road I'm walking down. I don't like the streets that I'm on right now. But right now, I have nothing. Mm -hmm. And to kill some of this pain that I'm experiencing, this takes it away. But I say to him, well, the pain's going to be there tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Then I'll get high tomorrow, Sean. Mm -hmm. I'll get high tomorrow. You know what I'm saying? Um, the trauma that's involved, you know, the early stages, what, what went wrong? Somewhere down that line, you right? So it is a health issue, but it's a health crisis. And yeah, yeah. and when we look at it like that, you're right, then we can look at, hey, what is the remedy? What is the, the serum that we can say, hey, that we can use to, you know, and I'm not saying it's gonna happen overnight, mm -hmm. But like I said earlier to you, ladies and gentlemen, it's going to take all of us. We yeah. all play yeah. a part in this. Yeah. We all play a part in this. We're, I believe in strength in numbers. And when, you have, when you have numbers mm -hmm. and the strength in that numbers, anything's possible. Yeah. Amen. And to Sean's point, and I want to talk about this when I was speaking, I forgot. But harm reduction, mm -hmm. right? In its current form, and I'm not saying there's not a need for it, there is, but in its current form, it's harmful to, for our community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very harmful for our community. 
right? So we need to be able to come together and design something. And like Sean said, we need to identify it, yeah. then have conversation with our community in terms of how to address it. Yeah. Because in its current form right now, and this is a model that's being mm -hmm. uh, um, endorsed yeah. by government. Yeah. This is a model that's being spread across Nova Scotia. We have another question back there. Right. I think. Sorry. Yep. I see one back there. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Great presentation by the panel, and I think we've had some really great questions. Um, I was trying to be more in the capacity of listening today as a provincial employee. Um, and, uh, ah, um, ah, there he is. <laughs> but um, I also figured um, I'm, I could bring a little bit of a different perspective to the conversation. Um, I met a lot of you in the room before, but for those I haven't met, my name is Darren Van Morgan. I'm the manager for the homelessness programs in the province. So, uh, sometimes. Um, so something I just wanted to add really quickly was, I think we have a lot of great points. Um, there is a lot of great conversations going on. I think the collaboration and the union that we need in the community to be able to bring forward different proposals to push our agenda forward and get us heard at that table. I'll say to you what I always say to Marcus all the time. I can't promise you heaven on earth, but I could promise you we raise hell in there for everyone in here every time. That's all. And a lot of the times to get decisions made and to get policies changed, it's been repeated over and over in this room, we need data. We need information. I can't go in there and propose something without evidence. We will always get asked, especially by this government, what evidence do you have to support that? You need more funding, where, why, how many people? So I know we have a history that is not very favorable to us in terms of what the government has done with data, different organization has done with data, but my plea, if anything you take from me today, is to be open-minded to it, to be open-minded to your use of data, to your use of HIFAS, because it makes my job so much easier when I can go in there and show that evidence that we need to use an African Nova Scotia approach in this, because it affects our community differently yeah. due to these statistics, due to these results, due to these factors. So I just want to say in conclusion that we are listening I know the results doesn't come as fast as we would like to, but we are listening and we are trying. And I need you to work with us with that. Thank, Thank you. you. This young man back there. I have some stats for you. The index is here. I'll send them right to you. Thank you very much uh, for those wonderful presentations. Uh, my name is Joseph. I work with the Youth Outreach Association at the Valley. Um, just asking uh, you if this support and this services is actually extended to the valley, because we have quite numbers of blacks and African Nova Scotians in the valley too that are going through these issues. And um, oftentimes I've not seen services like this, you know, taking care of them. And whether we like it or not, it's still gonna grow. Mm -hmm. So before this happens, uh, is there any future plan or current plan going on to take care of this at the Valley? That's just my question. I have to leave now because yeah. we are leaving for five o'clock. Thank you. Okay, that's our last question. Anybody on the panel want to? Because yeah. it's at it's five. And I, I don't know if we're being run out the room, but you know. I just want to let you know in the Valley, we have the Valley African Nova Scotian Development Association. Robert French is the executive director there. They have yeah. resources for employment and other things. And the African Nova Scotia Justice Institute, which is under the umbrella, well, they're on their own now, but they did come under the umbrella of DPED. They have a program now for incarceration. So there is a program up there also to help with that. So um, make contact with me. I'm on LinkedIn. I don't answer very well, but I'll try. Yeah. And we just want to talk about the Africville um, um, thing tomorrow from 1.30 to 4, but I think it might be sold out. Yeah. Uh, yes, um, it, is, it is sold out, but um, the museum itself is yeah, the museum itself is open uh, from 10 until 
until 4 tomorrow. Um, it's a very modest uh, Uber ride, less than, <laughs> less than $15 to get there on your own. Um, I would encourage anyone that's able to go. It's a short distance, 15 minutes from here. And please do reach out to us as we are interested in connecting with other communities that have this history of displacement in, um, in their cities and regions. And I'm Siobhan from Hogan's Alley. Okay. No sense. <laughs> thank well, you, thank you, folks. I'm going to behave myself and end. I am encourage you to get uh, the information from the panel if you would like to talk to them further. Thank you for your attention. You were wonderful.